Yo, what up? This is D-Night, and you're listening to the Pardon the Interaction podcast. My, oh, my, we've had so much going on. Uh, for starters, in case you missed it, we've got a new addition to the Par and Pie family, Tara Dublin. Make sure you go follow her on Twitter at Tara Dublin Rocks. Also, pick up a copy of her book while you're at it. Make, make her day, The Sound of Settling. A very fun and interesting read compared to the things we talk about on this podcast. <laughs> But yeah, we're heading toward the do or die time for the 2024 election. Go ahead and hit up JoeBiden.com. Get that man like a dollar a month or something. Help his campaign staff up and get prepared to try and save our democracy. And make sure to grab like one other person you know and tell them about the podcast. Make sure they subscribe and tune in every single week. We got a lot of things coming up for you this year. We need all the support that we can get. So if you do your part and help us grow our audience, we'll do our part and help elect Joe Biden in 2024 and save American democracy. And this is the Part of the Interaction Podcast. Yo, what up? It's your boy D Knight, and you're listening to the Part of the Interaction Podcast. We've got yet another pocket part episode for you today. Of course, we just dropped a couple of episodes with the ladies uh, where we discussed the impending, insane, asinine, no evidence based impeachment of Biden. Drawn up by the GOP Clown Show Caucus in the House, uh, as well as the indictment of Hunter Biden for, well, I don't know, some crimes we didn't even know existed. He basically bought a gun. Yeah, of course, don't let the media get out here and make these false equivalencies between everything that Trump did and 91 criminal counts he's facing and like the president's son buying a gun. It's like not the same. Uh, So make sure you go ahead and check those episodes out. Before we tackle a couple of news topics, let's give a shout out to our sponsor, Sheets and Giggles. My man, Kyle McIntosh, sent me the awesome, softest sheets in the world. I get you the best quality sleep imaginable on these things. People take all kinds of drugs and supplements and tonics and teas and whatnot, but really what you're missing out on is just a wonderfully soft set of sheets from Sheets and Giggles and it'll help you sleep right. Plus, they're sustainably sourced, so you don't have to worry about killing the planet any any more than we already are. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're looking for a discount, check the show notes. We've got a couple links in there. Anyway, let's go back in time a little bit. If you weren't aware, uh, the special grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia, that Fonnie Willis used to investigate Trump and his other co-conspirators, they released their grand jury report, um, finally made it public. And of course, this differs from the actual indictment uh, that Fonnie Willis charged Trump and others with uh, using a normal grand jury uh, in the sense that the regular grand jury that issues indictments is in practice totally led by Fonnie Willis. Like they hear the evidence that she wants to present, like she fills out the indictment, she presents it to the grand jury, they take a vote. Well, the special purpose grand jury is more of an investigative tool and they take the lead on a lot of things like they can take the investigations into directions that they prefer uh, of their own accord and hear from witnesses that they think might be more valuable. And at the end of the process, they make a decision to take a vote uh, to recommend to Fonnie Willis for indictment all the individuals who they believe meet the burden of probable cause when it comes to the commission of a crime. And I think one of the first things you'll notice is that compared to the actual indictment issued by Fonnie Willis, which included 19 defendants, the special grand jury, however, recommended to Fonnie Willis that she indicted a total of 31 people. So there's 12 people that didn't make it into Fonnie Willis's actual indictment. And a couple of um, notable names from that list, of course, are Senator Lindsey Graham, we still ain't got no explanation for why the fuck he was trying to call people to tell them to overturn the 2020 election for Biden. Like there's there's no explanation for his behavior. Also of note, former senators from Georgia, Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue, who went on to lose against uh, Warnock and Ossoff in the runoff elections the day before the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Boris Epstein, Cleta Mitchell, and of course, Trump's former national security advisor, Mike Flynn, notably a number of these people were present for that um, December 18th meeting at the White House that went off the fucking rails where Trump appointed Jeffrey Clark, the acting attorney general, so he could file that fucking fraudulent letter through the Department of Justice as well as attempting. Well, I guess he actually did agree to make Sidney Powell special counsel so she can run around the fucking country seizing voting machines. Also, the special grand jury recommended charges against most of the fake electors who attempted to vote in place of the actual electors for Georgia. 
in an attempt by Trump and crew to have Republican Congress members not certify Biden's electors at the Capitol on January 6th. All right, so let's take a second to think about what the fuck happened with these unindicted co-conspirators. Well, for starters, with Lindsey Graham, Loeffler, and Purdue, uh, likely what you would have is the argument that they were, and this is not necessarily to say that I agree with this, but just that the argument would be because of the speech and debate clause, which gives a fairly broad level of immunity to members of Congress as it pertains to their legislative duties, especially while on the House or Senate floor, but even tangentially related to their duties as a member of Congress. And even if that immunity doesn't entirely extend to all of their actions, it could make uh, quite a bit of the evidence that might be used against them in court to to prove the prosecutor's case. Like that evidence, there's the potential that it could be ruled inadmissible by a judge based on the speech of the big clause. And of course, um, even if it wasn't, I'm sure Lindsey Graham at all would make the argument that they are immune based on speech or debate. And it's possible that like you could hang a jury with that argument alone. Similar to the way Trump's yet to be charged for inciting violence on January 6th, because there's the potential that a first amendment argument could swing a jury in such a way as to not convict, even though, you know, he clearly incited violence. As for the fake electors who weren't charged, a number of them eventually cooperated with Fonnie Willis's office, and this is likely one of the reasons that led to the delay between her announcement that an indictment was imminent and the actual indictment. But yeah, uh, they kicked their lawyer to the curb after the lawyer failed to provide them uh, Fonnie Willis's proposed offer of immunity in exchange for the testimony, and once they got a new lawyer... Uh, they ended up cooperating. I guess that's going to become a running theme here in these trials of Trump's co-conspirators. But yeah, because a number of them weren't so significantly involved in the planning of the actual fake elector plot. They just, you know, showed up to write their names down on a piece of paper. Uh, you know, they probably weren't the most high value targets. And in likely, in all likelihood, some of them may not even have deserved to be prosecuted. Like it's it's difficult to tell who was a willing participant in this plot and who was just a dupe, right? Who was just like showing up because this is what they were told to do. And, you know, Fonnie Willis has the right to exercise her discretion when looking at the special grand jury's recommendations and decide who would likely be more suitable as a cooperator than a defendant. And, you know, she exercised that ability. And that helped to narrow down the number of defendants and that likely makes the trial more feasible. I mean, it's, you know, far... <laughs> it's exponentially more difficult to try 31 people for Rico in Georgia than 19. And I imagine, you know, given the way things might go here in the immediate future with Cheese Bro and Powell, uh, if they're found guilty during their trial, uh, the number of criminal defendants might whittle down even further. You might get a few guilty pleas get some cooperating witnesses and end up having a more solid case for the other defendants who are not choosing to exercise their right to a speedy trial. So where does that leave Boris Epstein, Cleta Mitchell, and Mike Flynn, who had already pled guilty twice to line of investigators uh, and who happen to have the opportunity to change his guilty plea and thanks to Bill Barr? Uh, and, you know, his representation in Sidney Powell, who's actually currently under <laughs> indictment <laughs> in Georgia. What a fucking crazy tangled web we weave there. Um, yeah, where, did it, where does it leave those folks? And I think if I just had to put my finger on the idea of what Fonnie Willis was thinking here based on the evidence available to her, is that if you think about it in the broadest possible terms, they entered into a conspiracy with Trump and his other cohorts to overturn the 2020 election, but at the federal level, right? Like interfering with Congress, plotting to abuse the powers of the Department of Justice, and, you know, maybe even using Flynn's brother to withhold reinforcements uh, from the Capitol Police on January 6th, right? So things that, I mean, in the broadest possible sense, they do touch on, like, what was playing out in Georgia, but like as far as direct evidence, like there's probably not very much to connect those people directly to Georgia, or at least not in such a way that would meet probable cause 
for the standards set by Georgia law, right? Because Fonnie Willis is a state prosecutor. Like, she can't prosecute people for committing crimes taking place outside of her jurisdiction. You know, a conspiracy to overthrow the federal government by various means is outside of her ability to charge. It's just not part of her mandate. Like, that's what the federal prosecutors are for, or for D.C. And I know what you're thinking. It doesn't seem fair that Lindsey Graham and Loeffler and Purdue and Mike Flynn and Mitchell and others get off, right? Because I'm definitely on board with the idea of prosecute every fucking body and let the chips fall where they may in court. You know, if they do happen to get off because they present evidence and, uh, that leads to a jury not finding them guilty, so be it. At least they got their day in court and so did we. I don't think that's what happened here, though. Uh, so their actions would likely fall under Jack Smith's purview or in other states where maybe the evidence suggests they were more likely to have prosecutors uh, meet a burden of proof. So I guess you're asking, like, what the fuck is Jack Smith doing? Well, not that I think he's basing his actions on any kind of political motivations, but from a practical perspective, he's looking at the, the political clock, right? The 2024 election is a year away. And I'm telling you now, if Trump is reelected, uh, there's no way these charges are going to stick as far as Trump is concerned. Uh, and of course, once he does take office in January, and I'm not saying I expect him to be reelected, but I'm just saying that there's the possibility and should it happen. Once he takes office in January, Jack Smith is fired. All these charges are dropped. That's what's going to happen. So obviously, if you need some incentive to get out there and motivate people to vote for Biden in 2024, there you go. And even then, uh, you know, I think Smith's office understands that. We were all a victim, like the entirety of the United States, of voters in general, were all victims of Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 election. And he needs to get this evidence on the record uh, through the process of a criminal trial so that the American public can make up their minds before they vote in 2024. Not to influence election in a negative way uh, for Trump or a positive way for Biden, but just so that people have the facts. And from an even more practical standpoint, like if he believes people committed crimes, like in Trump becomes president and shuts down the investigation, then those individuals won't be held accountable. So the first, you know, first things first, got to get Trump indicted and in court on trial. And one way to make sure that happens as fast as possible is to keep the charges against Trump as simple as possible. And what that means is like, to some degree, they worked their way up from the people inside the Capitol on January 6th all the way up to the White House. But the people in Trump's inner circle who are directly involved in these tangentially related plots, um, those people haven't been charged yet. Keyword there is yet. Because let's say Jack Smith in, indicts a number of people in Trump's inner circle with evidence that implicates Trump in a number of ways. And now Trump has the opportunity to request the judge and join his trial with others, making it more complicated, uh, adding, you know, a significant amount of delay thanks to legal motions and filings from all the other defendants that he might potentially be put on trial with, uh, similar to what might happen down there in Georgia with a RICO indictment. He potentially be in a position to do what he wants most, delay his trial. You know, so far as set for the spring, if he could get it to delay to the summer, you know, he could go out and public and claim election interference because the trial's occurring close to the election, even though he's the reason it's being delayed. Or, you know, he might luck up and get it delayed until after November, once the votes are already taken place. And he could use the fact that there had not yet been a trial or a verdict to obfuscate from the actual evidence and, and say he was innocent. Although, you know, you'd believe that a person who believes they'll be found innocent in court would want their trial to take place as soon as possible so they could do uh, like Trump did with the Mueller report and declare himself completely and totally exonerated, which was some total bullshit, by the way, you know, for people who actually read the report. Uh, I'm sure you're quite aware, but if you didn't, like, it didn't do what he says it did. But, of course, no one reads this fucking shit, and the media is broken, so they were able to whitewash that shit in such a way that he didn't even get impeached for it, let alone indicted, which is fucking asinine and insane. Uh, but, 
what I think Smith is doing here is cutting off the head of the snake. So if he goes goes ahead and nails Trump now, uh, you know, because it's the most pressing matter, uh, he'll have plenty of time and opportunity to work his way back down the ladder and indict all the other co-conspirators, a process that could become a years long endeavor, uh, you know, which would be rendered moot should Trump not face prosecution win in 2024 and shut down the entire investigation anyway. So once he's nailed Trump, you can consider all these other people who were clearly involved, but who are yet to be indicted. Just consider that clean up on aisle 45 time. And don't forget, like Smith is still investigating. Um, You know, the grand jury in D.C. took a six week hiatus, but they were back a couple weeks ago. Right back at it. uh, Hearing evidence, hearing from witnesses like this shit ain't over. Not by a long shot. And on top of that, don't forget, there are also other state investigations taking place outside of Georgia uh, relating to the the fake electors plot in Michigan and Arizona, etc. So, yeah, while I wish everyone was indicted and on their way to trial right this second, um, clearly investigations are continuing. And I do believe that they are likely all be facing indictment eventually. Now, of course, I, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a handful of people who are tangentially involved, uh, but there's not enough evidence to suggest that they'd be convicted at trial. And maybe those few people will get off. And I mean, there's not really anything you can do with that. That's just the way that's just the breaks uh, for such a massive criminal investigation like this. You're likely not going to get every single person just like you're not going to have every single person who attacked the Capitol on January 6th end up indicted by DOJ. And that's not the fault of anyone currently involved in Biden's Justice Department. It's just the fact of the matter that Trump was president at the time and pulled all the strings, controlled the FBI, controlled the DOJ, uh, didn't have proper security prepared for January 6th, allowing his rioters to storm the building and, and end up at the chambers of Congress in mere minutes preventing law enforcement from being in a position to lock down the Capitol and arrest everyone inside at the time. Like, I mean, you know, there's, it's unfortunate. Uh, These, this is the fallout for letting Trump in office uh, in the first place. Like it's America's fault. Like you, you put him in a position to have power. Therefore he was in a position to abuse it. And of course there were always going to be consequences and fallout for that. But going back to finding Willis for just one second, the fact that she chose not to indict every single person recommended to her by the special grand jury is in fact evidence that proves that she is not out here on a witch hunt, going wild, abusing her office, trying to indict anyone and everyone that she can for political reasons. Anytime these fucking fake detractors on the internet trying to bring this shit up, you can point that out and totally discredit their argument in mere seconds. Yep. So let's take a detour down to South Florida real quick. I know given with all the crazy insane news, it's not the sexiest topic in the world, but Trump is under indictment down in Florida. And and people forget this. Uh, The evidence in Florida is likely far more overwhelming than what's being uh, presented in D.C. and in Georgia. Also, the Florida case isn't just documents, right? It's also obstruction. And Trump is pretty fucking nailed on that one, uh, considering that Yusil Tavares, the IT guy, who once he dumped his Trump-paid lawyer, Bob Woodward, in exchange for fucking public defender, uh, won't be prosecuted because he's decided to cooperate, tell the government the truth, and become a witness against... um, Carlos de Oliveira, Walt Nada, and Trump as it pertains to the obstruction charges. Again, they're nailed pretty much dead to rights. So once the various flipped, he basically laid out a minute by minute uh, timeline of, you know, his conversations with Daly Oliveira, who talked to Tavares, asking him to, quote, meet somewhere more private to discuss deleting the surveillance footage of them moving the fucking classified documents around uh, once Trump had been notified that he was subpoenaed and needed to turn the documents over. So apparently after a call from Trump, Daly Overa 
took uh, Tavares down to the basement through a tunnel into a little small room that they refer to as the audio closet where Daly Overa told him that the quote boss wanted the security footage deleted. Now, Tavares was the dude that was like, I don't know if I had the administrative rights to do that. <laughs> but De Oliveira did not care. He was like, the boss wants this shit done. So apparently after Tavares was like, you know, bro, look, I I can't do this shit. De Oliveira contacted the head of Trump Org security and was like, hey, man, so how does this security footage thing work? Is it possible to have it deleted? And you'll never guess who of all people thought that might be a fucking red flag. Of course, Matthew Calamari Jr., (laughs) who you might be familiar with from the prosecution of Trump Org CFO Alan Weisselberg. So, of course, the guy who was uh, taking impermissible uh, company benefits is like, yo, man, we cannot have motherfuckers out here deleting their security footage. Not only was he like, nah, bro, we ain't deleting shit. He went around and told the rest of the security team, make sure absolutely none of this gets fucking deleted. Because clearly, I mean, it set off all kinds of fucking alarm bells for this guy. Like he knows the routine around here. <laughs> He's like, some someone's afoot. <laughs> and not only that, like after they engaged in the cockamamie, Wally Coyote styled Acme catalog, harebrained scheme of trying to flood the server room, like Calamari was the dude who was like, all right, we they <laughs> they keep coming up with some new shit. We gotta move these fucking servers. So he moved them out of harm's way in an attempt to preserve the, the footage and the data, which was eventually subpoenaed and recovered by prosecutors. Now again, I don't think most people realize this, but this is the most open and shut case of obstruction of justice in the history of obstruction of justice. Well, except for that last time where Trump fired special counsel Robert Mueller. (laughs) Other than that, this is the most open and shut case. Now, I personally believe that given all the unethical behavior on the part of, you know, Trump supplied lawyers for witnesses and co-defendants, DOJ is likely investigating that shit, too. And I mean, it's it's entirely possible he gets hit with more obstruction charges in the future uh, relating to his attempts to uh, coerce witnesses into committing perjury. On obstruction, though, Trump is toast. The only thing that could possibly, possibly save him is the fact that Judge Cannon is totally on board with taking this case uh, in Trump's favor and might do something during the trial to get the charge thrown out or throw out some of the most uh, damning evidence leading to possibly hung jury. And then maybe there not being enough time to retry the case before the election. That's, that's his only fucking hope. And if judge cannon is in the bag for Trump, the way I believe she is like, it's not impossible that she'll find a way. But for the moment, she's doing her best not to show her cards. Like she's engaged in a protective order over the classified documents. She's not going to let, um, Walt not to have access to those documents and it appears that she has totally ignored Trump's request to have a skiff installed at Mar-a-Lago so he and his lawyers can look over the fucking classified documents so it remains to be seen but I would say uh, don't trust the fact that she's behaving right now as any kind of indicator for what she might attempt to do in the future she's a snake in the grass and that concludes this episode of Pour on the Insurrection